The Imbalance Written by Luke Melia Read by Ariane I'm sorry it's taken me so long to come and speak to you. I know you have been asking for me, Doctor, but I wasn't ready to tell you what happened. I'm not sure if I am now, but they keep telling me it will help. The boy died. I killed the boy. There is an imbalance. I don't know what you can do to help that. Broken. That's what Steve called me when he found out I couldn't have kids. Do you know what it's like to be called broken? We'd been trying for a couple of years before we got tested. I had assumed the problem was him, but it was me. Kids were always on the cards for us. We discussed it even before we got married. Steve wanted kids more than anything, and suddenly I couldn't have them. We always got on well. Quite a relaxed relationship, really. I used to tell people I was focusing on my career, but the truth is I couldn't wait to be a mother. Steve left me. Almost a decade together and he just left like that. This was a deal breaker for him. A few weeks later, he had to come back for his stuff. He just wanted to get what was his and have all this over with, but I delayed him from doing it twice. Not intentionally. Both times I had genuine reasons, but he sounded wound up on the phone. I knew how to get to him, though. He was an easy man to calm down. I wore my little black skirt that I know drives him crazy. When he arrived, I had a cup of tea waiting. I knew Steve. He was a polite man. Even in his most wound-up state, I knew he'd sit down long enough to drink it. When he did, I sat right next to him. They say if you know somebody is about to have a go at you, that you should sit next to them. It makes it harder to be angry when they are right there by your side. So I did. We didn't say a word outside of a few forced pleasantries. I could see him trying not to look at my legs. I grabbed his hand and ran it up my thigh. I could feel him resisting. Not enough to actually try and stop me, but just enough for him to be able to deny it's what he wanted. That's when he realised I wasn't wearing underwear. And after that, he had no control over himself. Would you believe I fell pregnant that day? We couldn't believe it either. It was a miracle. Nine months later, Mark was born. Our boy. Our miracle boy. Miracle Mark, we would call him. It's amazing how much improved between Steve and I once Mark was born. Not superficially, just like the last piece of the jigsaw had clicked into place. We were a family. A happy family. Do you know what it's like to be happy, Doc? I don't mean pleased or content. I mean actual happiness. That's what we had. It's funny how fast the time goes when you are happy. How every worry you have seems minor. Every concern for the future feels less important when you can smile through the day. We lived that way for six years. Can I go out on my bike? Mark asked, staring at me with those puppy dog eyes and that old red jumper he refused to take off. How could I say no? Stay where I can see you. There are strong winds forecast. The weatherman had been going on about freak storms for days, but nothing had come of it. They have a tendency to over-dramatise these things. I watched him through the kitchen window cycle around in circles on the path. He'll be okay for a moment, I thought to myself as I left to collect a bag of unwashed clothing from upstairs. On the way down, I could hear the wind picking up. It got louder and louder with each step. As I got towards the bottom, the noise was replaced with banging, crashing and screaming. I rushed to the kitchen window to see that thing outside. That swirling vortex, that tornado. How had it got there so fast? Mark was nowhere to be seen. 
I rushed outside, barely able to hold my footing. Mark was nowhere to be seen. I held onto the fence that lined the path to the road, gripping as hard as I could to avoid being dragged away by the powerful cyclone. Mark was nowhere to be seen. One step at a time I moved towards the end of the drive, shuffling my hands carefully from one post to the next. Mark was nowhere to be seen. As I reached the end of the drive, the tornado was in full force. And that's when I saw him, in the air being dragged around by that thing. Around and around he went, getting higher with each rotation. I had to save him. I gripped the fence hard, so hard my hand bled, and with the other arm I reached out to catch him. I missed, but I knew any second he'd come around again. I was ready. This was my last chance. If I missed him now, he'd be too high to catch next time. He was coming. A few seconds at most, but it felt like minutes as I stood there in preparation. I stretched my arm as high as I could. Mark could see me. His hand was stretched too. He was coming. Getting closer, this was going to work. His fingers were about to touch mine. Wait. That isn't Mark. I hesitated. The boy slapped my hand and continued on. Shit, quick, grab him, I thought. It was too late. He was gone. That boy... I saw the pain in his face as he went by again, twisted in equal parts from his fear and the ferocious winds. The tornado continued to move on until I couldn't see it anymore. I walked back into the house, numb from what had happened, and there in the doorway stood Mark. What are you doing outside, Mummy? He told me he'd gone in when the wind got bad. The next day that boy's face was all over the news missing. The town waited anxiously, but we all knew what would happen. And it did. Adrian Johnson, found dead in a scrapyard the other side of town. That thing had carried him for miles before dropping him in that dirty yard. I hesitated, and Adrian died. I could have saved him, but I hesitated, and Adrian died. Nobody knows, but I could have saved him, but I hesitated, and Adrian died. He died. He died. Because of me, he died. How is that fair? The boy died. I killed the boy. There is an imbalance. I saw his parents all over the news. The emotional turmoil was pouring out of them, their face almost as twisted as Adrian's had been when he flew past me. I lost something that day of the tornado. A part of myself was gone. I became withdrawn, quiet, uninterested. As the years went by, I just became worse. When Mark turned nine, Steve gave me an ultimatum. He said I was unhealthy for this family. He said that Mark was missing out on having a proper mother. He said I needed to see a therapist. He said he didn't want to push me into anything, but if I didn't get help, he'd leave. What sort of choice is that? I did as he asked. We weren't poor by any stretch. We always had what we needed, but £80 an hour is enough to make an impact. The therapist said I was suffering with post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of a significant emotional event. Really, Doctor? I'm suffering with PTSD because of an emotional event? You come to that on your own? Two hours of talking and £160 out the bank to be told I may be stressed because of Adrian. Slow clap, Mr Therapist. But what help could he give me? The boy died. I killed the boy. There is an imbalance. I didn't go back for the next appointment. I told Steve I did, but I just parked up in my car, put some music on, ate junk food and smoked. Steve would ask me how it went. 
I'd smile and say, I think we're making progress. I'm feeling better. I became good at hiding it, and he was stupid enough to buy it. Mark could hardly remember the tornado. He was just a normal young boy. I'd look at him, sitting there with all his friends. They'd be playing, smiling, laughing. Adrian doesn't get to have friends. Adrian doesn't get to play. Adrian doesn't get to smile. Adrian doesn't get to laugh. The boy died. I killed the boy. There is an imbalance. I remember a day when Mark was about 14. He asked me to borrow some money to go towards a game he had been saving up for. I had the money. It wasn't about the money. But I just stared at him. I could see how excited he was. Mark was a good kid. He wanted to stay in and play on his games console with his friends. Other kids his age were out smoking all sorts and drinking. But not Mark. He'd fallen in with a good crowd. I still said no. I was looking at his face and just thinking how easy his life is compared to Adrian's. Would Adrian have been a good kid too? Would he have wanted the game? His mother will never know because of me. Every time I looked at Mark, I saw Adrian. He could smile or cry or frown. All I saw was Adrian and his twisted face. They were about the same age. How can their lives suddenly be so different because of me? Why did Adrian have to die? How is that fair? Why didn't I just grab him? That went around and around in my head. I couldn't stop thinking about it. As I boiled up the spaghetti, I couldn't stop thinking about it. As I broke the mince up in the pan, I couldn't stop thinking about it. As I grated the cheese, I couldn't stop thinking about it. As I crushed up those pills in Mark's sauce, I couldn't stop thinking about it. It's funny how quick it happens. He just lay down his head and went to sleep. Steve was shouting when he walked in. He was shaking the body like a rag doll. I don't even know what he was screaming at me. I could hear nothing but white noise. There was a glow to everything, like a warm light surrounding it all. Not good or bad as such. Just a numb glow. Like it meant nothing. For a while, things felt like they were supposed to. Like I'd righted a universal wrong. But after a few hours, that feeling faded away. My boy. My miracle boy. Even with him gone, the scales remained tilted. The boy died. I killed the boy. There is an imbalance. I don't know how to fix this.